are listening to or watching Keep It Weird, the podcast for all things strange, spooky, musical, eerie, mysterious, a little evil, and everything in between. Each week we sit down together from across the country and we talk about something weird. And this week, of course, is no exception, as we dive into the wonderfully weird once again for your ear holes and eye holes. We are chatting possible psychic ability of a criminal profiler, strange human body facts, a terrifying motel that I will absolutely never stay in, ever, even if you paid me millions of dollars, and another song that seems to be cursed in the most disturbing of ways. All of the most bizarre things wrapped up to one episode, you lucky ducks. So get cozy, or as cozy as you can, with this 100 degree heat outside, I'm sure you're melting just like us. And get ready for a gossip sesh with your favorite ghost hosts. My name is Lauren, and this is my lovely co-host, Ashley. Hi, weirdos. Guess who's not hot? The girl with a fan. Actually. She's got a fan. That's a PSA for all of you out there. Because I've been to two weddings this summer, and I was the only one with a fan. And every single person that saw me was like, that's such a good idea. This was like $3. Genius. Buy yourself a fan. It's so nice. You know what it's nice for? This is for the ladies and and some of the some of the gays and days, and some of the straight men. Straight men wear makeup. Um, yeah. It helps with your makeup because like sweaty bodies are yes. sweaty bodies. But when you when right. you're wearing a face of makeup and you sweat, it's fucking it's tragic. Keep it cool so it's not it coming down your yeah. face. So yeah. So if you a get a nice percent. fan, you can sort of dry that sweat and not get as. That's a it's good tip and nice. I Life need tip. to buy one because we, it's so funny. We haven't had many weddings this year, which is insane. Ashley has been the one going to I weddings. I can't believe I've been for to weddings this I've kind year. of had a year off. Because <laughs> everyone but you know is married. <laughs> I know. Now they've all done it. They've all done it. But we actually have one coming up this coming Monday. And yes, you heard correctly. We a have Monday a wedding? who's having a, a How dare Monday they? wedding, which is inconvenient for everybody. I can't even get into it too much, but it's in Temecula and it's supposed to be like 95 degrees no. and the ceremony is for sure outside with no, no shade and then cocktail hour and reception is in an air conditioned building. Thank okay. God. But I, the fan is such a good tip because I know they're keeping the ceremony short, but even in a 15 minute ceremony, I'm going to be melting. So yep. the fan is a good call. Grab one. And I'm just going to have to wear like. A short dress so I don't die. Oh my gosh. I also, uh, another tip. Oh, I don't have it with me. Oh, I think I do. It's all the way over there. I'm not going over there. I bought on Amazon. This is not an ad for Bezos. That's just where I happen to get this. I bought this like, it's like in sort of like a deodorant thing. I have deodorant here, but not this. Um, and it's like anti- for the thighs. anti-chafing. It's for the thighs. It's like in a hot pink. Hallelujah. It's in like a hot pink little deodorant stick and you just rub it in between your thighs so that you don't create, you know, a fire in your pants. I love that too. So much to get for this Monday wedding. Listen, you need to go go shopping immediately. (laughs) Truly. Yeah. It's going to be rough. Um, I wanted to give one quick little shout out and like a little pat on my own back. Okay. There's a film okay. out right now. It's on Netflix. I would really appreciate it if you all went and saw it just because it's like kind of maybe one of my new top 10 favorite movies of all time. It's called They no Cloned bit. Tyrone. It is a oh, yeah. sci-fi movie starring Jamie Foxx and ooh. <laughs> What's his name? John Boyega. Hottie, hottie, hot, hot Star John Boyega. Star Wars nerd. Yeah, it's Star Wars. I know him from... Uh, uh, attack the block but yes Mm. he was in star wars apparently anyways (laughs) it is on netflix right now and the reason i'm patting myself on the back is because i had put it in a newsletter last year and i was like Mm -hmm. here's the synopsis of this awesome movie that's probably coming out next year it sounds amazing and i just like to you know i was right you were correct yeah everyone has been loving it yeah I have not had a chance to sit down with it because I just had family in town for 1,000 years, but I cannot wait <laughs> to watch it. You should. And Alex, Alex will it. like it, too. I was going to say, I think it's one we can watch together. It's like Blade Runner meets It Follows meets Get Out. Here for all of that. Yeah. Love yeah. that. Love that for us. 
but that's not what we're here for today. Although I would like to just kick my feet up and watch Netflix. Okay? It's been a long (laughs) day. That's why I've got my tequila. Mm. Tequila. And I got a white wine spritzer like your neighbor, Julie, who's 50 next door. (laughs) Also, I don't know if you saw me looking down at it. I scooped a fruit fly out and I've continued to drink it because you can't stop the party. I have always scooped flies out of my wine. <laughs> okay. I don't. Well, it doesn't bother me. We get each other. Yeah. Like, obviously, that's a thing. But I have been at parties recently, which, like, fruit flies are abundant. It's the summertime. And I feel like everyone I've been with recently is like, ah, oh, dang it, a fruit fly. I and have to throw my whole drink, drink out. And I'm it's like, like oh, okay. Just scooping out with your finger. Nope. I just scooped them out and threw them in the trash. You know what? Yeah. That is true. Like, you and I are a different breed. One, we're from the Midwest, <laughs> so I think that's part of it. Two, we're a little yeah. dumb. And we do have to share with the sure. listeners something that happened. If you follow my um, my personal Instagram, you probably are privy to this situation. But last <laughs> week, I was talking to Joe about root beer Uh, because we really like mm -hmm. a and w sugar-free root beer but you can't find it everywhere so i had gone to the store and i was like they didn't have a and w sugar-free root beer all they had were mug root beer and bargs and he was like barks and i was like bargs he was like it's 1000 percent barks it's not bargs and i looked it up on my phone because i was so positive it was bargs root beer and it was Barks. And then I was mad because I'm 35. I know I have said Barks out loud multiple times. And not one person has corrected me no. to say that it's Barks. The amount of people I've said Barks in front of with a clear G. Well, and that's the thing. Then we found out when I posted it on my Instagram, Lauren also thought it was Barks. Which, thank you, because I was like, am I just yeah. the dumbest person that's ever lived? No. Just the two of us. Well, what's really sad is I thought it would be something that connected, like, a big group of us. But instead, I got kind of attacked. Just, yeah. Everybody was like, you're dumb. And no one has <laughs> ever thought it was Bargs in the history of time. Not true. One like, of oh, our podcast so brothers, agreed. Matt, Moth Boy, Matt. From okay. the Moth Boy podcast, also thought it was Bargs. So shout out to Moth Boys, thank God. <laughs> Mike Johnston, Christ. past guest of like our Detroit and also like New York, mm-hmm. and just our wonderful friend and past guest, actually like assaulted me over text message and was like, "You're a liar. There's no way you thought it was Bargs. <laughs> that is dumb as shit." And like he's saying that as a loving friend, as weird as it sounds, I think he was just like, "How? How have you gone like, this oh. long?" Yeah, so never was a cue to me. Every single person was like, don't you remember their ads? Barks has bite. And I was like, first of all, obviously I don't. Second of all, bad ad because mug root beer is the one with the dog. Yeah. So wouldn't mug have bite? Right. We should get into it. (sighs) Lauren is going first today. This is a show about weird stuff. (laughs) Oh, I love us. Okay, we are going to start with the segment that you all know and love by now. Where in the world is keep it we're going? Where in the world is going? Carmen San Diego in her like really cool hat. Very cool mm. red hat. Where's she going? Where is she going? Mm. Well, we're not going far this time. Oh. Um, which sorry, womp womp. Usually in these segments, I feel like we have traveled we travel all the over the world, but we're just headed to Nevada. Oh, that's not far. That's way closer Um, to you than me, but it's not far. Yes. It it would be a trek for Ashley, especially if she was driving. But for me, like, hop, skip, and a jump. We're real close. Um, We are headed to a place that I would never actually go, but for all of you freaks out there, maybe you'd like it. The Clown Motel. No! Is a clown-themed motel along North Main Street. No, we're not doing this segment. We're going to move on. I refuse. What do you mean clown hotel? <laughs> I actually cry. have seen pictures of the clown motel because people send it to me all the time. Like, I think you would like this. And I'm like, why? Who, why do you think I would like who this? Who and where? Tonopah, <sighs> Nevada. Okay. It has been referred to as America's scariest motel. Mm. And it is a building located adjacent to the historic Tonopah Cemetery. Of course it is. Where when so I many think people clowns, are buried... I think dead bodies buried in a field. Yes, 1,000%. Hmm. 
It is a nightmare. It is a 31-room clown motel that was opened in 1985 by Lenroy and David in honor of their late father, Clarence David, whose collection of over 150 clown statues was used to decorate the property. And it has since been sold to a couple of other freaks. I'm going to call them all freaks. In 1995... Bob Perchetti bought the motel and operated it for 22 years until 2017. Then he put it up for sale for $900,000, which, like, the fact that a whole motel sold for that much money. I mean, maybe things are different in Nevada, but to me now, Nevada. To me nowadays, that sounds cheap. I'm like, for an entire motel? Uh, But it's a clown motel. Yeah, I was going to say, caveat, though, you also have to buy the clowns. But I have one thing to say about this. How dare you? Yes. Me? The man who collected the clowns, the people who made oh. the clown motel, you for telling me Clarence. the story, the people who stay at the hotel. Like, how dare all of you? How dare you bring this to the world? This is why we're not reaching apotheosis. <laughs> this is why <laughs> the aliens are like, they'll never they'll reach never it because make of this it. clown motel in Nevada. Okay, so it's just because I've seen the outside of it, and I haven't looked further. Yes. Because every time someone sends me a link, I'm like, guess what's not getting clicked on? Um, Are they in every room? Yes, they are in every single room. So I was like, let me get into it. And the reason I was, like, talking about the people who have, like, been selling it and passing it on is because, like, the first two people who, the siblings who opened it in honor of their father had the 150 clown statues and then Bob who bought it after them just kind of kept that alive and kept the history. But then this person who bought it in 2017, they, um, appointed an art director and gave the whole place a facelift and tried to make it look more like, Ooh, cool retro motel, which is super trendy nowadays and add more clowns. So it now has 2000 pieces of clown memorabilia. And it is a nightmare to us. Like, we are very upset by it, clearly. But there are horror enthusiasts who seek out this motel. And people who love spooky historical buildings, who are, you know, drawn to the eerie decor. But also they're fascinated by the ghost stories that come along with this place. Because it's next to a cemetery. (sighs) Okay. So, the world-famous Clown Motel calls itself America's Scariest Motel, but it's true for several reasons. It's located to the cemetery, which houses mine workers who died in the tragic Belmont mine fire in 1911. God. So, it's a bunch of angry and sad mine workers. Horrible tragedy. So, there could be ghosts from there, but also it houses Clarence, the father of the original owners. So, he's right there. He's He's probably coming in to play with his clowns. So, you're going to see him. And also, the hotel is just so creepy because of the decor, because it's some happy clowns, but it's a lot of terrifying clowns that have come in over the years, and clowns that may have belonged to tragic households that could be carrying some sort of energy with them. It kind yeah, of covers you know every horrifying base. Yeah, these clowns weren't bought firsthand. No. We don't know the history like, of these clowns. History. They're going to be, like, dirty, beaten up. They're coming from somewhere. And it extends through the entire motel. Mm. It's in the lobby. It's in all of the rooms. And each room has two to three custom art pieces inside that feature clowns. There's also going to be things hanging on the wall looking terrifying down at you. Maybe even on the ceiling looking down at you while you sleep. And a few of the rooms are famous because of tragedies that happened inside them, and the owners will tell you all about that history. They love to share it. It's like you walk in and they're like, let me tell you everything. Most Fear hotels try not... to hide the tragedies Sweep that happen the within the and walls. They're like, and they're like, actually, no, a ton everything. of tragedies have happened here, and you can find them in this book I wrote. Here you are. Here you are. And... Fear was not the initial intent with the siblings that opened the hotel. They were just like, an ode to our dad who loved clowns, yay. But now it is so fed into, and like the reason the owners talk about it is they're like, come to our haunted motel, because that's what is selling. Ghost adventurers have been there, of course. course, Zach Baggins has a fear of clowns, and so he did a whole thing about it. I mean, it's fine. He was like, there's a demon in every one of these clowns. (laughs) Demon clowns, which has never been said once by any of these clowns, but I'm sure he said it. Also, some movies have been shot at this spot. One called The Clown Motel, Spirits Arise. Oh. 
And then there was a Huluween special um, on Hulu called Return of the Killer Binge. Which I have a lot of questions about that. But go ahead and check them out, (laughs) everybody, because I don't know what that means. So here is what has really happened, just to put some of the most haunted rooms in there, just like we did when we have stayed in haunted places. We're like, there are some creepier rooms than others. There is a little bit of history. Room 108 is the most notorious room at the Clown Motel. An elderly man who worked at the motel's front counter decided to spend the night in one of the rooms. He wasn't feeling well during his entire stay, Mm -hmm. but when he called the front desk, his coworker did not answer. So the man decided to call his sister for help, and she immediately dialed 911 because she could tell something was really wrong with him, but it was too late. He died on the way to the hospital because he was so violently ill out of nowhere that he couldn't even make it to the hospital. Jeez. And when the front desk worker was asked about the situation, they claimed they were at the front desk the entire time. They never once left, and the phone never rang. Sure enough, surveillance footage showed that the phone never rang, and the front desk worker was standing there the entire time throughout that time frame where the person was Jeez. not feeling well. It was as if something had been stopping the victim from calling for help. It's real room 1408 of you. Mm-hmm. The room has since been decorated after the film It, as if to represent the mischievous apparition that would mess with phone lines, maybe, at night. So now you can go in and see Pennywise and maybe not be able to make a phone call. Cool. Love it. Room 111 has the history of a terminally ill man once staying in the room. Every The illness... Go home. Knowing he... <laughs> go to your house. <laughs> Don't stay at the clown motel. <laughs> He knew he might only have a few days left Mm. to live, and he wanted to pass away without being a burden to his family. So that is why he stayed here. Every night, he went to sleep expecting not to wake up the next day. However, he kept waking up again, and he claimed that every morning he saw a shadowy figure in his room, and he begged the ghost to take his life because he was in so much pain. When nothing happened, he later shot himself in the parking lot after growing so frustrated and so out of options that he thought this was the only way out. He literally went there because he was like, if there's one place I could be killed by a ghost, it's here. It'd be here. They will certainly take my life here. they won't take me. And then he ended up having to do it himself. Which, it's just so horrible altogether. So this haunted room is currently themed in the horror horror film theme, The Exorcist. So, What? And what does that have to do with clowns? It doesn't make any sense. I think they just want it. Listen. It's like the, the horror film thing didn't really have to do with the movie It. They're just like, oh, we're making it horrifying. So now they have exorcist like puppets and clowns. And many guests who have stayed in this room have talked about seeing ghostly figures. And they think they may see a dying man laying in the bed when they set up a camera, whatever. You just have to see for yourself if you're brave enough. If you dare. If you dare. In room 210, a man stopped to stay the night after experiencing extreme back pain again. Why? Are you going there there when you're ill? There has to be another option. He had faced this pain his entire life, but he never got a proper diagnosis. He just had to deal with it, and he was like, oh, I'm having another episode. I'm pulling over. And when he woke up that next morning, he felt more comfortable than he had in a long time. Hmm. He believed the spirits of the room had cured his back pain, so he lived at the motel from that moment on, and he never experienced his back pain as severely after that, and he passed away in that room, that very room, six years later, room 210. So are they friendly? Are they friend or foe? Well, it doesn't sound like anything has made people feel darkness, as some of the other ones have. It is themed after Halloween films. Sure. So again, still filled with clowns, but with a little Michael Myers thrown I in I think it. it's weird that they're um, like, these clowns love this horror franchise. That's what I'm saying. They've, but again, they're <laughs> but again, now like diving into this. Listen. Like it has become something totally different. It's haunted and now they're making it like Halloween, um, the holiday and the movie. However, despite the spooky decor, many guests favor this room because the spirits are positive. It gives off an energy of positivity. You still might, like, see something, but it's happy. Um, And then this is the last one, room 214. Melvin Dumar, an associate of billionaire Howard Hughes, stayed in this room for about three years. 
People believe that a ghost in the room grew fond of Dumar and was devastated when he left. Visitors claim that the ghost often returns to look for his friend, and if he doesn't find him, he will play little tricks on the guests, such as flickering the lights, causing a mess, and stealing items. And this room, for absolutely no reason, now has a theme of Friday the 13th. <laughs> because camping. Because I just spit. I gleeked. Oh. That got me good. Because you're right. It has nothing to do with it. But I can't stress enough how much this current owner is just like, we are now a horror We're hotel. We're a horror hotel. Come but here for horror. with more more clowns and still some visitors probably in the night. So I still never want to stay here no matter how Halloween and horror movie you make it. Mm. And that's just me. But if you want to, it's on 521 North Main Street, Tonopah, Nevada, 89049. I'm just giving you the whole How close is Tonopah, Nevada to like Vegas? Like how close are other things in Nevada? It's like smack dab in the middle between Reno and Vegas. So you could be like doing a road trip and easily go there. It's in one of the old mining towns. So pretty much all you have to do there is go to an old mining museum or this hotel or like some of the old saloons, which I've never been to this specific town, but Alex and I did stop in a mining town last time we were in Lake Tahoe in California, because you also can do a road trip through Nevada on your way back. And that ended up being so fun. Like the old mining towns are kind of like spooky and they try to look like the town has never aged. Yeah, they try and preserve so, them. Totally. You get a little of the mining history. So like go there, get some history, stay at the Clown Motel if you dare. It's super cheap. You can stay there for like seventy to eighty dollars a night unless you request one of those specific rooms that I mentioned, and then it could go up to like a hundred and thirty, a hundred and fifty. Which is still a not night. bad. It just depends. Not bad in the slightest. Mm-hmm. Just depends on what you're looking for. Go check it out. I never will. And yeah, if you go, yeah. take a picture for us because you won't catch <laughs> us dead there. <laughs> No, and even from a standpoint of like we like to do investigations, I I can't. I physically cannot. I'm not even afraid of clowns. clowns Like I don't have a problem with clowns, but when you're like, look at all these clowns, I'm like, something sick about this. Something sick about this. It is love of clowns. I even like growing up. My grandma, you know, she she had like dolls. She had that. What's that sock monkey doll that like all grandmas had? It's like a little sock monkey. No, okay. Um, she had like no. one of the famous sock monkey dolls, and she had like I a think little of porcelain lamb chop, dolls. The puppet who really freaks me out. <laughs> lamb chop scares no. you? Yes. This is the song that. Nah. What about the Muppets? Different. No, for some reason I can get on board with Muppets. Maybe it's because I'm just immune because my husband is obsessed with them and has figurines everywhere. Maybe you don't but like. Honestly, oh well, no. The Muppets creepy, are hand so. puppets, huh? Listen, yeah, but yeah, what but I was saying, like more, Grandma okay. also had, like, two or three clowns in this room, too. And yeah. I remember being like, I just don't want – I'm not scared of them. I just don't understand sure. the appeal of them. No. So when you're like, I love clowns. Here are all my clowns. I'm like, what's wrong with you? And in that same vein, like, I – It's not even, like, clowns clowns. Like, yes, if a clown was walking around, I'd be a little like, But, like, if he's just honking a horn and spraying water out of a flower, whatever. But clown figurines are a little unsettling to me. Because, like you said, like, why do you need that decor in your house? I don't like it. It doesn't make me feel happy. I'm not into it. Yeah. So... And I wouldn't be able to sleep in a room of those figurines looking at no. me and those art pieces. I also wouldn't be able walking to sleep. Into a lobby. I wouldn't be able to sleep in a room full of dolls, period. Whether they were Yes, clowns, dolls are the children. same, as we've discussed. Yep. <laughs> Little no. children, no. And it's next to the cemetery where, like, hundreds of people from this mining town died. No, it's just a no. Just a no for us. <sighs> Sorry. Well. And that's it. Yay. I had a thought. <laughs> she did it. Yay, she did it. Yay. I love when you have a thought. She did it. <clears throat> she had a thought. She did it. She had a thought, everybody. Congrats. I'm so proud of her. 
You know what I did today? This was so dumb. Like right before I left for work, I had like some some of my bangs are like too long. Like what's happening here? So I like did a little trim uh-huh. and then I went to work and I got to work and I just had like bang trimmings, like just framing. My... It was cute. Just like the little sprinkles yeah. of hair. Yeah. Whoops. Oh, forgot about that. Adorable. I am so. <laughs> I had a thought. Anyway. I'm yes. going to preface this thought with a trigger warning and a caveat. Trigger warning. I'm going to mention some famous cases involving murderers, most of which being the serial variety. Um, but I'm not going to get into any like super nasty details. I also want to be clear, and I will reiterate at the end, but before anyone gets fired up, I am not trying to discredit any hard work done by this human man. I'm just saying, what if... Uh, what, what if? if she had a thought, had a, thought. a passing thought? Just want to share my thought. Get off with her you. back. What if? Okay, so I was watching that documentary I told you about last week on Max. I hate them yes. for making me say Max. I but know. But here we are. I just want to say HBO, <laughs> but we can't. Max is Max. not a thing. The show is called A Body in the Basement. It's a kind of a wild idea for a series. It's literally just stories about murder cases in which the body was found in a basement. But whatever. The first three episodes were pretty good. So I, I recommend it. Really graphic, though. Like, super graphic. Goes into details of the murders. So far, three episodes and no dudes getting murdered. Not a fan of that. Interesting. You know some dudes have mm. been found in a basement. But anyways. The first episode of the series took place in wood river illinois in 1978 which is about an hour away from my hometown the murder was of a literally stunning 23 year old woman named carla brown and like i said i'm not going to go into details of that unless it pertains to what fbi agent john douglas had to say about it because he's actually the subject of my thought today so a little backstory for anyone who doesn't know, John Douglas is the man who created criminal profiling when it comes to serial murderers. The Netflix show that we will never get a third season of, no matter how hard I cry, Mindhunter, was based off of his early FBI career. This man interviewed serial killers all across the United States, including Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, the BTK killer, Ed Kemper, Charles Manson. If they were serial killing, he was talking to them. He was having a chat. The point of which was to understand them, what their motives were, what made them tick, what triggered them to kill, how they chose their victims, etc. And by doing all these interviews with these men, um, he was able to then look at certain crime scenes and murder investigations and give the detectives an idea of who they should be looking for. Because we now right. know, um, in 2023, that serial murderers are completely different animals than mass murderers or... Yeah. One-off murderers, like it's a completely different totally. situation, or like a, a organized crime, totally different animal. Right. And for anybody who has watched all eighty-five seasons of Criminal Minds, that is what their job That's is. What their job Working is. for the FBI as murderer profilers. Exactly. So it's like this all comes from that. <laughs> oh, but this man, it. John Douglas, was so, so good at this i don't think there's been anyone like him since freaky way and i was thinking what if part of the reason he was so good at this was because he had some form of clairvoyance Mm, a little bit of psychic ability yeah not something that he even knew was happening to him not something that he like recognized And again, I don't want to make it seem like I'm saying he didn't work hard. It's just a magical power. Yeah, but listen to some so. of the profiles he came up with and tell me it's not some kind of psychic ability. Like, I don't believe you. <laughs> In Carla Brown's case, all he had to go off of were crime scene photos. He looked at the photo of the scene years after it had taken place. And listen, I've seen the photos. Obviously, the body was blurred. Thank Christ. But I do not understand for the life of me, how he did this. How he drew his conclusion. So he saw these pictures of this crime scene and he said that the murderer was unorganized and unsophisticated. He believed it was the killer's first time killing and didn't believe it was his original intent when going into the home. 
He believed Carla had maybe rejected a sexual advance. He believed the killer was a white male in his late 20s or early 30s with a high school education, some vocational training, probably electrician training, and an unkempt appearance. He said the cops likely have spoken to the killer already and he would likely pass a lie detector test. He said the killer knew Carla's routine somewhat and likely lived or worked nearby. He said the killer likely drove a Volkswagen that was older, beat up, and red or orange. He said if they created a media frenzy indicating they were closing in on the killer, he would be spooked and nervous and he would probably leave the area. But he also said that if it stays quiet, the killer will reach out to you guys and say something like, quote, Hey, I want to help out as a witness, but I don't want to be considered a suspect. Ooh. Very specific. Extremely all specific. Friends. So they took this profile, they compared it to their top three suspects, one of which, a neighbor named Paul, fit the bill to a T. White male, high school education, unkempt appearance, knew Carla's routine, had taken electrician classes passed his first lie detector they gave him years prior drove a beat up volkswagen that was rust colored and wouldn't you know it called their office as the police were re-questioning his friend and offered to help by saying quote i want to help in any way i can as a witness but i don't want to be considered a suspect okay okay I wish I could do the whistle. That is insane. How on earth would you know? How? What kind from of just a few man? photos. <laughs> and again, I don't doubt that this man, you know, he was very intelligent and he could read absolutely clues and figure things out. We are not discrediting no. him, but that is wild. How specific he got. I feel like. It could have been in his subconscious. Like exactly. you said, he didn't even know he had the ability, but he was getting like pictures from somewhere. Cause that is too insane. It's so insane. It's too And I, listen, I know how he did some of it. I know he guessed he had electrician chaining cause he tied her up with electrical wire. Okay. Right. I know sure. that he assumed he was a white male because oftentimes killers kill within their own demographics. Like, okay. But the mm -hmm. Volkswagen? And the color of the car? Like, how, goddammit? The how? orange? The burnt orange? <laughs> how? How? Oh. And that he would call in and say that. Because, again, if you know serial killers enough from your studies, like, maybe. Mm -hmm. But that still feels so specific. But this isn't a serial killer. I mean, according to him, he thought okay, this was his well, first even... time killing and it wasn't even his, his intent. So, like. Okay, then that's even <sighs> crazier. John Douglas made his mark in the world during the Atlanta child murders. From 1979 to 1981, young black men and black children were being murdered at an alarming rate in Atlanta, and no one knew why. The police force was adamant they were looking for a white man, possibly a member of a white supremacy group like the KKK, which honestly, yeah, that's what I would assume mm -hmm. too. But as soon as right. Douglas was on the case, he came in and was like, nope, this is what's happening. He's black. And his reasoning, totally brilliant and not psychic at all, was that these boys were disappearing from a predominantly black neighborhood. If a white man was picking them up, someone would notice. I've seen it, yep. If a black man was Makes picking sense. them up, maybe it would go unnoticed. So John went public mm -hmm. with this theory um, against the wishes of the cops because he just knew. He just knew that, that, that they were looking for a black man. He went right. public with the theory that the killer was probably a young African-American male with a fixation on police culture who owned a dog, probably a German shepherd. That's what he said about this guy. The media reported soon after that fiber evidence had been found on several victims. And as soon as they did that, Douglas was like, we have to start staking out bridges because... He's going to start b dumping bodies and sources of water to get rid of the evidence. So we need to put people on every bridge in Atlanta. And what do you know? Wow. May 22nd, 1981, investigators who were staking out a bridge heard a big splash and pulled over a car that crossed the bridge, which happened to be a surplus police car. So like an out-of-commission police car that had been bought. 
driven by 23-year-old photographer Wayne Williams, and found fibers from his home and hair from his dog, which was indeed a German shepherd. <gasps> and it matched the victims. Well... Okay. That's what's crazy about this guy. Douglas can look at a crime scene and tell you how many people perpetrated the crime. He can tell you if it was planned right. or unplanned, the type of career the person would be right. interested in, the car they would drive, the clothes they would wear. Their dog. Their dog. Off of one case. A lot of profilers can do this after the killer or violent offender has committed multiple, multiple crimes. Because you can look, you can build a yes. profile of who the victims are, how they are killed. Look at their pattern. Exactly. Yep. But Douglas can look at a single crime and basically tell you who did it. Exactly. Right. So it just got me thinking. That's insane. <laughs> Of people throughout history that were exceptionally fantastic at this thing that almost seems impossible to do. How do we know they didn't have some kind of psychic ability that not even they would be aware of? Aware of. Yeah, it was just popping into their brain. John Douglas was like notoriously a pain in the fucking ass because these people, like these people, were like, <laughs> "How is this possible?" He's like, "I just know it. Like, back off. I just know it." I just had to trust him. I think that having a, some sort of psychic connection would also have helped him tremendously when getting into the mind of these men, getting the answers out of them that he sought. Because when hundreds of other interviewees would have the wool pulled over their eyes and be fooled by these dudes, John Douglas would go in and talk to them and get the real deal within a matter of sessions, sometimes the first time meeting the man. Jeez. And that would be frustrating. I'm like, well, how are you, how doing, are you doing it? it? I tried. Well, and it's cool that he went on and, like, taught this for his entire career and, you know. Of course. And changed the mm -hmm. game forever. And it's why we have the profile, the profilers that we have. So it's very cool, but damn. But damn. But I'm not the only weirdo who thought this about him. Douglas was actually asked once if he was a psychic. Probably more than once. But, like, once that there is a record of... One time he sure. went to a police unit, and this is actually in the first season of um, Mindhunter. I don't think Mind this Hunter. conversation is, but like this case was. He went to a police unit to help them with the case of an elderly woman who had been savagely beaten and sexually assaulted. He studied the crime scene photo of this one assault and said, okay, here's what I think. It's a 16 or 17-year-old high school kid. He'll be disheveled looking. He'll have scruffy hair, generally poorly groomed. He'll be a loner, kind of weird, no girlfriend, and a lot of bottled up anger. He comes to her house. He knows she's going to be alone. He has probably done some odd jobs for her in the past. And at that point, he paused and said, there's someone who meets this description out there. And if you can find him, that's your guy. And one of the detectives on the force asked, are you psychic? And he said, no, my job would be a lot easier if I were. <laughs> and the detective said, because we had a psychic named Beverly Newton in here a couple weeks ago, and she gave us almost the exact same description. And again, he's psychic. It's an elderly woman sure. who got beaten and sexually assaulted and murdered. Like, how do you make the connection that it's a teenager? Like, what about it? Presents that what to your about brain. that's a teenager to you? I, I, I mean, obviously, I, I'm nowhere near this world in general, right. so I would be like, it's definitely like a 58 year old <laughs> man. I have no idea, but that a teenager. How did you get there? I want to follow all the steps. I don't know. He may have had the gift. Well, he doesn't object to it. Um, he once wrote, "What I try to do with a case is to take in all the evidence I have to work with, and then put myself mentally and emotionally in the head of the offender. I try to think as he does. Exactly how this happens, I'm really not sure. If there is a psychic component to this, I won't run from it." So he never said, "Like, like absolutely that. not, I'm not a psychic." He was like, "Listen, if if it, it is comes psychic, like." good like i'll take it great like, it's I'm, helping me it's helping, it's helping me the world. it's helping the world and i yeah. i don't think that you know this silly li little thought or theory of mine pertains only to criminal profiling if you've ever watched um paul mccartney write the song get back for the beatles like that shit is insane he was just like it's channeling just the music and the words and it just came and it just came out and That's I, what I'm saying. I think it happens, and you just yeah. don't know what it is as the person. Paul McCartney might not have known, but there well, was. Well, I've even reached out to to um, 
friends of mine that I know that are mediums or psychics and been like, I don't know. I don't know how to tell if like I'm having psychic thoughts or connecting to spirit or like whatever, or if it's just my inner mom, like, how do you tell the difference? And they've all been like, I mean, you kind of can't, you just have to kind of like trust that what is coming into your head is, is real and true. Yeah. Right. And I just think some people are closer to or have the ability to access certain capacities that we, we all have, but some people just are able to access it more freely. And if you can find out how totally. to use that ability in your life or in your career, the sky's the limit. I think you are bound yeah, to excel. Good for you. Yeah. If you can figure out how to tap into that, I think that it just sort of happens for you. Totally. That is a very cool thought. Yeah. And I'm with you on it. Also, just to shout out um, one more thing, John Douglas, he has a couple books that I highly recommend. Um, I've read two of them, but I haven't read the other one. Where are the? I wrote them down. Uh, Mindhunter, obviously. One's called Mindhunter. Mm-hmm. The show's named after it. Another one's called The Killer Across the Table. And then the other mm. one is called The Anatomy of Motive. So in his Ooh. books, he details a lot of specific cases and a lot of specific profiling he did so check it out if you want to hear more he's a fascinating we dude we love that we love that john douglas john <sighs> and a fan <laughs> all right we are going into a segment we've only done once before but it was presented to us by a friend she came up with this segment idea and it was one of those $50 segment ideas, which you are also welcome to do. Beware of ballads that can invade your brain. Make no mistake of the melodies that cause pain. Tune out the tunes that cause you to quiver. Hymns that haunt are sure to send a shiver. Cursed crooners and spooky songs. Crooked covers and scary sing-alongs. Cold courses and sordid sonnets. Crazy canters and sinful soloists. Cursed crooners and spooky songs. This segment is sponsored by our good friend Mel, our under-the-sea expert and beautiful human being. Under-the-sea. And she wants to remind everyone, every time we do this segment, we are giving her the shout-out that she deserves. She wants to remind everyone about Shout Your Abortion or ShoutYourAbortion.com, providing resources and safety for those living in states with handmaid's tale level laws. You have a safe space and you can find answers with this website with these people, ShoutYourAbortion.com. Okay. Get the help that you need. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Cursed crooners and spooky songs. And in today's Kroost. Kroost? Kroost Kerner. Kroost Kerner since Perky's maze. <laughs> Why is that so funny? I want that to be the title instead. Kroost Kerner since Perky's maze. Okay. Oh, we are <laughs> going to a song that was so funny called Gloomy Sunday. Ooh. <laughs> I, this is like a serious topic, kind of. Get it together. But I can't get over it. <clears throat> Gloomy Sunday. Gloomy Sunday. Not Bloody Sunday. Gloomy Sunday. Sounds fun. Really fun. In Vienna, a mm. teenage girl drowned herself while clutching a piece of sheet music. And in Budapest, not long after that, a shopkeeper was found dead, seemingly by his own self, um, left a note that quoted lyrics of the same song. In London, a woman sadly overdosed while listening to a record of a specific song over and over and over. Is this real? This, yes. The piece of music that connects all these deaths is the notorious Gloomy Sunday, which was also nicknamed the Hungarian Suicide Song, and it has been linked to over 100 deaths, usually from taking one's own life, including the one of the man who composed it. What the fuck? Very scary. I know. 
I will not get graphic with any of these, but I guess I should throw in a little late for a trigger warning, but maybe Ashley will throw something in sooner. But I promise not to get graphic and super detailed, but there is going to be talk of suicide just because suicide. of what has actually Can't happened it, in this story. Yes. My God. But we will not get crazy. I know. So the connection could just be coincidence and you could call it urban legend, but those details are certain of the sheet music and the notes being involved. But one thing is for sure, Gloomy Sunday's composer, Rezo Ceres, hmm? I'm sure I'm not saying that totally correct, but he did take his life and the success of his greatest oh. hit may have been a contributing factor. It all just kind of goes together. So It was a hit. It's not some like secret thing that's only on like four records in the world and it's nope. hard to find wow it was very widely known wow, i will wow, get wow. into that okay so in 1933 the hungarian born Ceres, as i was talking about was a 34 year old struggling songwriter some accounts have him living in paris but others budapest but either way he was probably traveling back and forth between the two, and the story goes that after his girlfriend left him, he was so depressed that he wrote the melody that became Gloomy Sunday. It is a minor key, spooky-sounding song, like words and lyrics aside. Anytime something is in a minor key, it just ugh, gives you that eerie feeling. Right. So he found this spooky tune, and then he was given a melancholy. He was given melancholy lyrics for it in Hungarian by his friend and poet Laszlo Javor. And some reports claim it might have been Javor's girlfriend who left him, and he wrote the lyrics. And it was a, just a poem first that was put to music. Okay. Again, things get kind of. It was nineteen thirty-three. What do you want us to do? It was nineteen thirty-three. What, what do you we want? To We're ask? giving you the best we can. God. But the two of them wrote this together. Somebody's girlfriend okay. left them. There was depression involved, and then this came about. And Ceres did add a few of his own lyrics. He was more talking about war and apocalypse, and Javor wanted it to become a heartbreak ballad, and together they came up with Gloomy Sunday. The song did not make much of a splash at first, mm -hmm. but two years later, a recorded version by someone named Pal Kalmar was connected to a rash of suicides in Hungary, and that's where the story started to gain traction. The song became banned shortly after it gained popularity because it was believed the song was causing these suicides. Nobody could make any direct connection because all it was was a couple of cases of they had played it earlier that day. The song was in their head. They were writing down lyrics. They were clutching the sheet music. But everyone could just say, like, that was Chance. It's a popular song. Yeah. But either way, the song was banned because it was so depressing and dark that Hungary was like, no, we're we just not going to do, do it. And people loved that it was a juicy story and that it might be a cursed song. And so once this, you know, became more of news throughout Hungary and spreading to other places, music publishers from America and England soon came a calling because they were like, what is this dark what song we need to get our hands on? What is this crazy tune? We want it over here. Why? Why? They're saying it causes death, but sure. So then there is this man named Sam M. Lewis from Tin Pan Alley, and he, was all, he also had a partner who was a British theater lyricist named Desmond Carter, and they came together and wrote an English translation of the song. Lewis's version was recorded in 1936 by a singer named Hal Kemp and his orchestra, and that really caught on because then it was being played in America and in England and gaining popularity for its English translation. And we know how to take things and run with them and be crazy. So it really got going. And Sam did change up the lyrics a little bit when he was translating it. And he even added a third verse of hope to make it more commercial. So the whole song is just like death and despair. And obviously you can all go look up the original lyrics, but... And it's like, but don't worry, everything's fine. Don't Please don't kill yourself. Not this Don't time. Do it. And that was it. I'm wow. just kidding. But okay. <laughs> that was it. No, the first line to the third verse starts Dreaming, I was only dreaming. I wake and I find you asleep in the deep of my heart, dear. So that opens up the third verse saying, like, everything we thought was death and despair and losing our loved ones was she actually didn't leave just me. a dream. Okay. Hopeful. So he changed it and then it was put out into popularity. Yay, just a dream. And then in 1941, even though it was pretty popular already with the English translation, Billie Holiday recorded the English translated really? version. And then it really became popular. 
But having Billy Holiday associated with this song that had the rumor of causing suicide mm-hmm. in Hungary, well, when Billy Holiday is associated with it, and she kind of had this tragic like party lifestyle, like her life ended way too soon in tragedy, that helped the rumors along of like, of, of course, course. Billy Holiday singing it, blah 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 blah. So everybody gets talking. Doesn't help the rumors at all. And despite conflicting reports, the song was never officially banned in the U.S. But it was banned in England in the early 40s. The BBC deemed the song too upsetting for the public and then later said that only instrumental versions could be played on the radio because the lyrics were too upsetting, even though the instrumentals were still dark and minor and interesting, but very gloomy. So we'll never know what for sure was causing these people to take their own lives, but there were several occasions, and again, you were asking, like, is this real? Like... The little evidence we have, whether you say it's coincidental or not, is that on several occasions, someone had the song either playing on a record player, like they found the person as it's still going around, or they were clutching the sheet music or a note with the lyrics on it, or friends and family would report that just before the person died, they were complaining of not being able to get the song out of their head. And that was just facts, and it was true. And you can make your own conclusions from that. So it's quite strange, regardless of what you believe. Um, And then just to wrap it all up, what happened to Ceres, the writer of the song? During World War II, he was put in a labor camp by the Nazis, which he survived. Oh. Went through this crazy thing, but survived. And then after that, he worked in the theater and the circus. He was a trapeze artist, man of many talents. Wow. I think that's a fun tidbit. He really just wanted to be a performer in some way. And then, after his success as a trapeze artist, he did return to songwriting, but he never was able to get a hit as big as Gloomy Sunday. And in fact, the story goes that when the song first became a success, he attempted to reconcile with his ex who inspired it, but he found out that she had poisoned herself, and there was a copy of the sheet music nearby... In other versions of the story, she may have just left a note with the words Gloomy Sunday on it, but either way, people are saying something about the song was nearby and she had taken her own life. And whether that's true or not, Ceres himself did commit suicide in 1968 by jumping from the window of a Budapest apartment building. After not being able to find success after the song. Can we all vow not to look up the song? No, that's the thing is... Even people, I heard, like, I looked it up, and a few, like, modern-day artists have covered it, including Sarah McLaughlin, which I was like, you Sarah. have done enough with your depressing songs. Yeah. The dog commercial already <laughs> makes me... So she is just, like, Sarah. ready for violence. Yeah, she's ready but... for something. <laughs> And I don't know, like, obviously we are not hearing ramblings of this anymore, even though modern artists have covered it. So I don't know if it was just something going on there. And maybe, I mean, he took his own life in 1968. And I don't know if that was then, like, the end of it. And we haven't heard of anything. It does seem like everything kind of happened between the 30s and, like, 1968. So maybe that was the end of the curse. Who knows? Obviously, maybe it, it depends on like what you believe the, in. But... original recording that was cursed, too, and not necessarily totally. any of the subsequent recordings. Did you ever read Lullaby Absolutely. by Chuck Palahniuk? No. Okay, Chuck Palahniuk uh, is an author. He wrote, uh, most famously, he wrote Fight Club. Mm. But he also yes. wrote a I was book like, why do Lullaby. I know that name? And so Lullaby goes a little off the rails. I'm not actually a huge fan of it. However, the concept of the book is so fucking creepy the concept of the book is that some someone got a hold of this like old indigenous african death song basically a song that they sing to like the dying and the people in pain that literally just kills the person and Mm -hmm. put it in a book of lullabies for children because just ignorance wise didn't know what it was they just knew it was like a a song from this culture so they put it in a book of lullabies and basically that book of lullabies is how they um explained sids sudden infant death syndrome is that all these people had this book of lullabies and literally read this like death song to their children to their child and so the book is about this like reporter who's going around trying to like track down all these um cases of sids where 
the uh, family had this book of lullabies. So like that sounds awesome. Book goes a little off the rails and it's a little too sure. wackadoo for me. But um, that's exact. Yes. That's immediately what Yikes, I thought of. Spikes. Also, I just want to wrap this up with um, Ceres's words when, you know, he was learning that what was happening to people, his conflicted emotions towards it. His quote was... I stand in the midst of this deadly success as an accused man. This fatal fame hurts me. I cried all of the disappointments of my heart into the song, and it seems that others with feelings like mine have found their own hurt in it. Which, I feel like his look at it is, like, so profound. And, like, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a curse. Somebody just related to it a little too much unfortunately mm -hmm. but he's like felt We're the way people. i did when and, i wrote it yeah and yeah totally mm -hmm. i mean it's like listening to the smiths you're like absolutely absolutely Good. i feel this dark yeah i feel this darkness thousand percent. all around me <laughs> yes wow thousand well that's percent. fucked up thank you for bringing that i to know our <laughs> such a attention. light light happy story <laughs> We're going to have to raise our uh, uh, vibrations before we get into the finale. I know, my goodness. But in the meantime, that is all the time we have this week for Keep It Weird. Thank you so, so much for listening. Next week, I don't know if it's going to be just me and Lauren. Uh, we do have a very, very... <sighs> very special guest coming up but i don't know when he's coming on and i can't tell do you do i know is. yeah i oh, sent you a God. screenshot and i was like guess who's coming on yes. the show yeah <laughs> it's a big one it's guys like, you're gonna be super super <laughs> fucking pumped um i just i can't announce it yet but we have a big guest coming up we're really 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 excited about i'm jazzed it. So stay tuned I'm super jazzed. um in the meantime though please Follow us on social media at Keep It Weirdcast. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter, sort of. We're not on threads. Maybe we will someday. We are on Facebook. We have a Facebook page that you can follow. But more importantly, we have a Facebook group. There are They are two different things. The Facebook page is just like us posting shit. The Facebook group, you can post stuff in too. We share a bunch of funny memes. We share creepy we share TikToks stories with each other. Best. We have a bunch of um, chat threads going on. We have like a horror movie chat, a mental health chat. It's, it's a good time. Please join us. We really enjoy talking to you guys on Facebook. Check out our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash keepitweirdpodcast. That's how we make all our money um, to produce this show. You can donate $1, $5, 10 or $50 for a sponsored segment to our show. And in return, you'll get ad-free episodes. You'll get bonus episodes two a month. Two more episodes than everyone else a month. It's pretty Love cool. That. And pretty awesome. uh, newsletter at the end of every month and discounts on merch. There's a bunch of shit. You should do it. It's great. We love our patrons. Um, cool kids are doing it. More than everyone else. Yep. Oops. Also, Oop, please, please, if you are watching us on YouTube, and even if you're not watching us on YouTube, but you have the internet, which I know you do because you're listening <laughs> to this right now. Go to youtube.com slash keep it weird podcast. Hit subscribe. Subscribe to our channel. Uh, you make us look good. You get us closer to monetization. Um, you love us. You're our friends. Why wouldn't you want to do this to support us? And of course, do the right thing. Do the right thing, guys. <laughs> do the right thing. Just There's a bee in the back, and every bee attack, and I turn it to a beehive blitz. There's a bee in the beehive corner, blitz. and everybody. <laughs> oh. I jumped it. Listen, I didn't have a second verse. I was oh. really winging it. Beehive blitz. Beehive blitz. It's hive mind. Oh my gosh, Alex just did the most violent sneeze Alex, from the dining room. I hope that it was caught it on together. the microphone because everyone <laughs> should know how horrifying that man sneezes. It just made me jump out of my skin while I was dancing to the Beehive Blitz. And there's a sneeze in the back and everyone attacks and it turned into a Beehive Blitz. <laughs> <sighs> this week it is my turn. Um, I think our song raised our vibrations, but let's give it a second and just... Oh, I do feel happy. Happy thoughts. 
happy thoughts we're thinking happy thoughts we're singing happy songs we forgot all oh. about the suicide one <laughs> that yep. was a really I'm flapping my arm song. flaps and it makes me glad there you go <laughs> Um, this okay. week, Lauren is sending me a psychic message. We're absolutely going to get it. No doubt about it. Um, yeah, we are. We are Nobody is questioning. Zener cards. We know all the shapes. There is no triangle involved. <laughs> no. Is the shape you're sending me? Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. 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 Okay. Ready. Okay. And send it. I swear on my life I saw a triangle. Please send it harder. <laughs> oh, no. I keep getting a triangle. So is it a star? No. Circle. I get circle a lot. I was saying circle message <laughs> so hard. I saw and a then triangle. I was like, a circle's round. <laughs> I saw a, I saw um, a triangle that was so clear to me that I literally was like, damn. <laughs> I know. No I was time. like, I have to know what she was laughing about. I know which is the story of our life. Oh, that makes me so sad. Okay, I right, I want to look up on? more tips because you looked them up the last time. So I want to see if I can find tips and tricks that can help us, like you did before. Because we're gonna get it. We're getting we, back. Listen, we got it, and then we lost it, and then we got it back, and then we lost it again. Then we got it a little bit, and now it's gone. So that's what was confusing. It's been a lot of up and down. Because even last episode, like if I had trusted my gut, we were there. But this week, like, woo, we didn't have. I it, did not so. have a circle. No, no. I had I a triangle. Mm. I know. And I had squiggly lines last week, but I decided to look at my ring lights shadow <laughs> in my lids and trust it. Yeah, maybe instead. we need to really okay. kind of like, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't close our eyes. Why Mindful? are we closing our eyes? <laughs> we should look right at there each other. There is no other. need. There's no need to close our eyes. It's true. If I look into your eyeballs, that's true. Mm. That's true. Anyways, have a you good see? week, guys. We love you. Keep it weird.